sometimes the physics behind, for example, well, another the reactions, the reaction, the actual change, and then the ultimate question is about the process of the Tonight in the Scholar's Chair is Dr. Jonathan A. C. Brown. He is Associate Professor of Islamic Studies and Muslim Christian Understanding in Georgetown University School of Foreign Services. For the next 30 minutes, we will discuss his new book entitled Misquoting Muhammad, The Challenge and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy. Let the conditions of inequality that we suffered under, when we are the oppressor, the, the dominant class, let's not impose that injustice on the others. Anybody think that you could have a just system without giving women their rights? Everyone has an opinion, and we sit around the marketplace and talk about opinion, but what is truth? With the shareholder, their goal is similar to the business, to maximize profit. That belief becomes a context for a development of knowledge. Say physics is the DNA of technology because the rules for how you build new technology starts in physics. Because Quran challenges mm -hmm. the people. It's not only the people of the book. It challenges Muslims. We say secular. They hear godless. Right. What was intended? Watch the Scholar's Chair every Monday night. And here is your host. Professor Brown, welcome to the Scholar's Chair. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. The, I wanted to ask you, uh, your PhD, where is it, where did you get it from? University of Chicago. University of Chicago, and you are now teaching at Georgetown, right? Yep. Yeah, for, how long have uh, you been there? Five years or so, I think. Five years. Since 2010. Wow. You wrote this book entitled, Misquoting Muhammad, The Challenge and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy. Um, why did you write the book, and why is it important for us to know anything about the, uh, this, uh, about the Prophet Muhammad? It's important because uh, basically <laughs> it's in the news all the time. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it seems like every day yeah, someone's talking about, uh, you know, why does Islam say this? Why do Muslims do that? And yes. uh, so both Muslims and non-Muslims are, you know, basically posed uh, with this question. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized as I was, it was, not so much in my classes, but really, my public speaking at Muslim audiences, non-Muslim audiences, that there was just constant questions about, like, you know, why does the Quran say this? What does it mean when the Prophet, when, you know, how do we deal with reports about what the Prophet Muhammad said and did? And mm -hmm. why does, this, how does Islamic law work? And uh, so basically I wanted to write a book that kind of took up these issues and, but uh, brought the complexity to the reader, but also did it in a kind of a more accessible way. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe engaging way. So that was my, yes. that was why I did it. Yes. What, what do you think that um, Americans, uh, Jewish, Christian, Gnostic, you know, atheists, mm. what do you expect them to, to learn from the reading of this book? I'm, I guess I'm asking you to go to the end of the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, I would ask them for, I mean, I think that I would hope they would come away with a few main points. One is that the Islamic intellectual tradition is is incredibly impressive mm -hmm. and deserves to be taken seriously on, on its own terms. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not you agree with it, whether or not you believe in it, that's just nothing to do with it. We don't, we don't, you know, we can sit and appreciate Chinese art or Indian history or Platonic or Plato's philosophy. It doesn't mean we agree with everything Plato says yes. or if we want to decorate our house with, with uh, Chinese art. So, I mean, I think that to take it seriously as kind of a world civilizational tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and also one second thing is that, that it's, it's, it's a, it's a world tradition, a world philosophical, world religious tradition, and therefore it's dealing with a lot of the same questions mm -hmm. that every other philosophical religious tradition is dealing with. And mm -hmm. so Muslims have things to offer on questions like, you know, what's the meaning of life? Uh, what mm -hmm. is the purpose of law? Uh, how does society function? I mean, the Muslims have really pondered these things and have excellent contributions to offer even today, even for Americans. Yeah. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is to get them to uh, really think more critically about how uh, how religions work, how religious scripture works, how mm -hmm. interpretation works, and then to take that understanding and, and and apply it to to Islam as a religion, and sort of to to take 
take it seriously and not just mm -hmm. uh, believe what they see on Fox News yes, or whatever. Yes, yes, so they can actually do more analytical discernment, yeah. and, and uh, it, that would be that would definitely be helpful. Tell us about the Holy Quran. Uh, it is it is the primary source of mm -hmm. uh, information for Muslims, but but. Uh, tell me, what is the relationship between the, the Holy Quran and, say, the Bible or the Torah? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and do Muslims regard I any of them other than the Quran? Yeah. So, uh, in in Islam as a religion, as, and as described in the the Quran, the, the main revelation of the religion, uh, God has sent prophets to every community throughout history mm -hmm. uh, until the time of the Prophet Muhammad in the seventh century. Basically, if you were living in you know, Peru in 300 AD, mm -hmm. there was some, at some point, there was some prophet sent to you, to your community, you know, whether in the distant past, recent past. And many of these prophets brought revealed books, and uh, mm -hmm. these revealed books and the re religion that these prophets all taught was all the same religion. It's yes. monotheism, <laughs> submission to God, belief in, uh, belief in one God, uh, doing good deeds, prepare for the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens is different. These different communities kind of warp and misunderstand their messages in different ways. So you get lots of different religions in the world, mm -hmm. um, and some of the the actual original scriptures are also altered, mm -hmm. uh, or they're lost. So what Muslims believe about, let's say, the 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 Old Testament or the five books of Moses, or about the overall message and teachings of Jesus, they believe that the Torah was uh, re revelation given to Moses. Mm -hmm. And that uh, some parts of it have been misunderstood, some parts of it have been altered by the, the rabbinic tradition in Judaism, and so that's why mm -hmm. uh, Jews have different beliefs than Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with Christianity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Muslims, you know, honor and respect these the prophets: Jesus, Moses, Noah, Adam, Abraham, everybody, mm -hmm. um, and they venerate and re they respect their their scriptures. But the current form of those scriptures for Muslims is not necessarily authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, there should be, uh, by a uh, Muslim following the Quran, he should be able to accept, however, uh, Jews and, and Christians to be brothers of the Abrahamic uh, faith tradition. Uh, they're not uh, necessarily hating or despising them because they're Jews, because they're Christians. Well, I think this is a, you know, this is something that is interesting about um, American tradition, I think also about West, kind of Western European Mm. Uh, view of religion and society. Uh, you know, Jean, uh, Rousseau, in his social contract, he one of the last things he says in the book is, "We cannot live peacefully with those people we regard as damned." Right. Um, which is a, I think it's and it's interesting when you think about American media today or popular thought. People will say, you know, you have to tolerate every, everyone. You have to tolerate each other. If you you can't you can't really believe somebody is. Is, is going to hell and, and live next to them. Like there's this one Seinfeld episode where Elaine gets really upset because her boyfriend thinks she's going to hell and this really bothers her. She can't be with him. Right. Um, this is very, the Islamic perspective is very different. The perspective is, you know, obviously people disagree. They disagree on really important things, but that doesn't affect their ability to interact socially, to live next to each other, to be affectionate, to be compassionate, to, to, to be business partners, to rent and sell mm -hmm. to each other, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, um, the view of, of Muslims is that if someone is, else has rejected their religion and follows a religion that Muslims disagree with, we can, we can believe this. We, can say, we think you're totally wrong in your religion, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything about our relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, another important thing to keep in mind is that it's not just Abrahamic religions that we're talking about when we talk about previous prophets in yes. Islam. So uh, Muslims treated Hindus, uh, Zoroastrians, um, basically anybody they came across who followed an earlier religion, they treated them as what's called people of the book, people mm -hmm. who follow a, a religion that was originally revealed by God and but then got misunderstood or, or, or warped in some way or the other. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, Muslims in, in uh, when they ruled most of South, South Asia, India, mm -hmm. they had absolutely no problem looking at the local po Hindu uh, population yes, as yes. people of the book. Yes. Um, there is a gentleman, a scholar you probably know, uh, Professor uh, Aslan, who actually, There's Aslan, yeah. Yes, Aslan. Aslan. He uh, he talked about um, that to lump uh, the the whole Muslim community into one Islam it, uh, might be problematic. He said a better approach might be to talk about 
Islams, these mm -hmm. various different evolutions of Islam in various different uh, countries. Uh, uh, can you speak to that for, for a moment? Or I mean, he, he's, his perspective is that of someone who's a religious studies scholar, right. I mean, who sees religion as a human phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the kind of the mantra of anth what's called anthropology of religion or sociology of religion, is that you look at religion as a human phenomenon. Gotcha. Um, mm. So like, you know, we don't, uh, you know, so scholars of religious studies would be, uh, they don't kind of, they don't prioritize claims to a religion. So if mm. if I'm if I'm sitting here reading the Quran and, and I'm a very orthodox Muslim and I follow I mean I know the Islamic law and Islamic theology perfectly, and I would say I represent true Islam. And there could be some person living in a village in Malaysia who's you know thinks Islam is going to a local well and yelling down the well and asking the the spirit who lives in the well to help him. I mean that, mm -hmm. so uh, what a scholar from of religious studies would say is these are both equal. These are both equally Islam. Right. Um, what Muslims would say, people who are part of that religious tradition would say is, um, no, that's not true. I mean, there's, there's, there's sort of the range of what's acceptable as, mm. to be a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Within mm -hmm. that, there's kind of a range of really correct orthodoxy. And then mm -hmm. there's outside that there's people who are, you know, who disagree with each other or mm -hmm. different levels of disagreement, people who are uneducated, right, or don't right. know what they're doing, like this guy yelling down the well. Right. But they're not just going to say everything is equal. Mm -hmm. And there's another, I mean, there's been a kind of a pushback also against that sort of sociology of religion perspective that I noted, especially one scholar in Columbia University. No, actually, sorry. Um, like City University of New York, I think is where he teaches. A very famous guy named Talal Asad. Mm -hmm. His father mm -hmm. was Muhammad Asad. Right. Who translated right. the Quran. Um, so he's a very become a very important scholar of anthropology, and mm -hmm. he has described Islam and other traditions like it as what he calls discourse traditions, which mm -hmm. means you don't, it's not just a free-for-all. Not everybody who says they're Muslim and that they represent Islam does so. Uh, but in order to authentically be Muslim, mm -hmm. you have to basically construct a relationship to this tradition. Right, and actually, right, this book, right. in a way, is about how that tradition develops and how that relationship is constructed by different people. Yes, yes, that's what I uh, gathered in, in yeah. reading. There were so many different pathways and so many different methaps, I think that's yeah. what you refer them to. Exactly. Um, you uh, have talked quite a bit about hadith. What is it? What is hadith? Hadith, a hadith, or sometimes the plural and singular basically use the same hadith. Um, yeah. Hadiths are uh, re reports about things the Prophet Muhammad said or did, mm -hmm. and they are the second most important source of Islamic law and beliefs. Mm -hmm. But in, in fact, I mean, people, it's, you know, a lot of times when people talk about Islam, non-Muslims, they think, oh, you know, there's like, this Quran is like the Bible, and so we get to go look at the Bible and see what it says to know what Muslims believe. Uh, the Quran is like the Bible in the sense that it's a primary scripture for Muslims, but it's, it's a very relatively short book. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, a lot of the core um, Muslim beliefs and beliefs about law and, and dogma actually come from the, the, the hadiths. I see. So, the, you know, the Quran never says pray five times a day. It talks right. about praying, but doesn't say yeah. pray five times a day. It doesn't say how to pray. Mm -hmm. So we learn how to pray and when to pray and how many numbers of prayers we have from these hadiths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why they're a very important source. Yeah. But unlike the Quran, the Quran's written down very early. It's, I mean, actually, they just found these pages in the Birmingham Library yes, in, the, in the UK, yeah. which are dated to the the, to the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, basically. Mm -hmm. But we know it's already known from, from uh, historical evidence that the Quran basically comes from around 650, so I within see. a couple mm -hmm. decades of the Prophet's death, which is exactly when Muslims said mm -hmm. the Quran was promulgated as a document. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, you know, people can disagree about interpretations of the Quran, they can disagree about whether it's revelation or not, obviously, but that's, in terms of historical reliability, that's not really a big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, with Hadiths, it's a huge issue, right. and in fact, Muslims themselves uh, because they didn't write them down very early, mm -hmm. you had them passed on in oral form, sort of rudimentary written form for about 120 years before they're really written down systematically. Basically, a lot of people are forging them. And uh, because, you know, whatever political, cultural, economic, religious agenda somebody had to push in the early Islamic period, they would make up hadiths to, to advance it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things Muslim scholars had to do and continue, continue to try to do today is to sort out the, the authentic ones from the forged sure. ones. So that's the big challenge. Mm -hmm. How is that uh, process? I mean, how do you actually do that? Well, it's a tough thing. It's a tough process. There's been different approaches Muslim scholars have taken. Uh, one approach is really to just say, okay, look, we have the Quran. We have, it sort of tells us these crucial principles and, and and gives us 
clear rules. Uh, we have a reason. Um, mm -hmm. And so anything that kind of contradicts what the Quran seems to say or what our reason says, then we know it must be false. We must, mm -hmm. It can't be something the Prophet really said. Mm -hmm. um, so in what, that, that approach is sort of uses the content of the Hadith as sort of a lit, you sort of have these litmus tests of the, the Quran, mm -hmm. reason, and then you kind of check the content of the Hadith against those litmus, those litmus strips, and then you decide mm -hmm. if it's authentic or not. Mm -hmm. um, the, what became the majority opinion in Sunni Islam, and really actually in Shiite Islam as well, is uh, different because what it says is, wait a second, um, the Prophet Muhammad is a prophet. Okay, so if you mm -hmm. said to me, I found a book in the, my library, I found this book in the basement of my house, it looks really old, and it says, it's written by George Washington, and George Washington says, you know, there'll come a time when people will uh, have these little computers in their hand which will allow them to process data using the internet or something. Sure. We know it's made up because George Washington doesn't, people don't know the future. So right. People, right. Now, if you're a prophet, mm -hmm. you can know the future. So the problem right. is, what if, the, if you find a hadith attributed to the Prophet Muhammad where he says there'll come a time when people will have little you know, glass things in their hand, it will show words on them or give knowledge or something. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's what prophets do, <laughs> things they do is they get taught the future by God. So sure. you have, yet yeah, that test doesn't work. Yeah. If the Prophet Muhammad says, you know, X is right and X is wrong, or, and Y is wrong, mm -hmm. we might think, well, that doesn't sound reasonable, but he's the source of right mm -hmm. and wrong for us, so okay. sure. how do we object to that? So a lot of the tests we would use to decide if something is possible or impossible, true or false, mm -hmm. a reliable report or unreliable report, they don't really work for the prophet. And if mm -hmm. we allow those tests to govern what we think the, the prophet's authentic sayings are versus inauthentic, mm -hmm. actually what we're really doing is we're allowing Jonathan Brown's brain mm -hmm. about Jonathan, the way Jonathan Brown thinks the world should work, mm -hmm. that's actually going to define Islam as a religion. Yeah. Not, mm -hmm. he's not, I'm not going to surrender my brain and my reason to some mm -hmm. higher source. So right, right. because of that, Muslim scholars came up with this method of what's called transmission criticism, which is sort of trying to authenticate things based on looking at how they're transmitted, looking at corroboration, mm -hmm. and sort of try and take their brain, their reason, their, their biases out of the equation. Mm -hmm. They didn't succeed entirely, but they did their best. Mm -hmm. So that's, this is where the ISNAP comes in? And yeah, chain of transmission. Tra chain of transmission, just securing that uh, and, and removing re reason. Um, what do you think about the Quranic uh, the Quran only movement, mm. where the Quran only is movement is interesting. This is something that really emerged in the late 1800s right. in um, northern India. It, sort of, it continues to be sort of flourish amongst upper class people in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, a little brief flare, brief brief flare up in the Arab world, the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. It's actually present. You have it in Turkey as well today, mm -hmm. but it's uh, not really been. It was never part of pre-modern Islam. Because people, all, Muslims always understood whether they are Sunnis or Shiites mm -hmm. or they of whatever sect, actually, they yeah. all understood that the Quran could not be read on its own, um, because otherwise we wouldn't know that we had to pray five times a day, right? So there's right. all these. Right. They knew that you had to have the teachings of the Prophet around the Quran. Now, where they disagreed is what those teachings were, mm -hmm. and right. so that's why you right. have that's why Sunnis and Shiites are, and various different sects are different because they mm -hmm. disagree. But they actually all agree that the Quran has to be read through mm -hmm. the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. So the the Quran only movement is sort of unprecedented in the modern period, saying you only need the Quran. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's it's a, it's understandable why it exists because. There's so many hadiths, and some of them are, are kind of silly, mm -hmm. and those ones are not necessarily reliable, but yeah. uh, people hear about them. Um, and second, it's uh, the Quran. You know, in a lot of ways, religion in the, the 19th and 20th century is in a is in sort of a state of siege, where people are mm. you you sort of feel like you're just everything you believe is, your, and your holy scripture is constantly getting attacked. Oh, right. the Bible says this about fossils. Oh, the Bible says this about Genesis. And people, you know, so one of the things Muslims did, especially Muslims who were influenced by um, European thought in mm -hmm. India, people who had gone to British missionary schools or worked for, British, worked for the British colonial authorities, is mm -hmm. they were trying to kind of minimize their exposure. They're sort of, they wanted to cut down their scriptural exposure. They wanted, they wanted their scripture to be the smallest possible little body. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the smaller, the, the less scripture there was, the less attack you were going to get. I see. Um, <laughs> and so they, I think they, they kind of, the Quran is actually a very contained document. The Quran doesn't mm -hmm. have a lot of controversial stuff in it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. Uh, yeah. Contrary to what Fox News says, I mean, there's sure. not, um, the Quran, when you read it, this is, 
you know, there's not a lot of stuff you can object to in it, yeah. I think, yeah. in my personal opinion. And certainly, it's not full of the kind of uh, scientific, um, controversial scientific material or yeah. historical material that you find in the, in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to kind of get, get it so they only had this to deal with. And this mm -hmm. was their, their safe base for their religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, I understand that, that impetus, but it's not a, it doesn't give you a viable religion because mm -hmm. you... Mm -hmm. There's a lot of the Quran. I mean, you again, you read it, and in some parts of it, you wouldn't be able to understand without some context. Gotcha, right. And right. Uh, again, also, you you know, we know there's unless you're going to say, we no longer have to pray five times a day. We no longer have mm -hmm. to do all these other things that we know are part of a religion. The Muslims, sure. but don't sure. but aren't in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Then you have there has to be something outside the Quran that you're using. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that. That's where I think the movement fails. It's interesting. Uh, there, I think you mentioned in the book that there were some scholars who believe that the hadith actually extends the, the knowledge of the Quran. I think that the point, that's the point you're making. Yeah. Uh, I was curious, uh, what struck me when I read that was, was uh, there was, I think it's in Al-Baqarah, where the, the scripture actually mentions that, um, that uh, the Quran is guidance for anyone who, who is a person of faith. Mm. Uh, I think that is about the second ayat in the mm. in the Quran, mm. uh, in the Al Baqarah, and mm. and it goes on to talk about uh, items like uh, uh, truth stands out clear from error, mm. uh, which means, in my limited thinking, is that the human human being has the capacity to discern what is correct and mm. what is not mm. correct, and the Quran has helped us to guide us through that process. The other thing that sticks out in my mind when I read this was that the prophet was advised by God himself not to, uh, not to ma manipulate the affairs of men. You know, uh, the prophet was, was guided not to um, establish governments or, or uh, uh, manage the affairs of human beings. It was only to take the revelation to, you, to the human beings and teach it as clearly and openly as they possibly could. Um, that's, for me, uh, in my limited view again, uh, kind of uh, gives us an intimate relationship with the Creator in, in ways that is not often taught, uh, but, but is, it, it, to me is almost, we're closer walking in the sandals of the prophet Mm. reading the revelation for ourselves, what he mm. brought us and having this intimate, it's like Salat, you know, Salat mm. is this commune with, with the Creator. But I was curious what, what, uh, what some of the scholars that you've been writing about, how would they, uh, how would they deal with that kind of um, uh, challenge from, from people who are basically from the Quran only movement? I, mean, I think that there's, you know, there's lots of different registers to religious life yeah. and so in one sense, the Quran is a document that is an ex is a book that you can read and interact with at a personal, at an intimate level. And yeah. when you read, when you read book, you know, verses of the Quran that say, you know, did we not find you an orphan and guide yeah. you? Do we not find you lost, did orphan and give you shelter? Did we not find you lost and guide you? Do we not find you poor and enrich you? Mm -hmm. I mean, the Quran is talking to the Prophet, but it's also talking to me and yeah. you. It's talk so I mean, at the level of personal inspiration and guidance and kind of that that feeling of uh, a connection to the Creator, to truth, uh, feeling comfort, mm -hmm. um, uh, getting basic m ethical and moral teachings. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, I mean, I don't think anyone would object to, no Muslim scholar would say that that's not a real, that's mm -hmm. not an important a part of the experience of a Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, but that another, th then, but then you move on to a, like, let's say, more detailed register of religion is, okay, well, the Quran also talks about inheritance, and the Quran talks yes. about marriage law, and the Quran talks about um, what, what the, what's going to happen on the Day of Judgment. So yeah. uh, then you start saying, okay, well, maybe I'll just go out and divide up my inheritance this way, or I'll go and uh, do my, divorce my wife that way, or I'll go mm -hmm. and, you know, I'll, on the Day of Judgment, it says this is going to happen. Therefore, I should, you know, build a tent or something. I don't know, do whatever. Uh -huh. So the, the point is that, mm -hmm. is that there's all sorts of ways in which we can interact with the text of the Quran that also might impact our, our actions, our relationship, relationship with other people. Yeah. In that case, you need, you know, I think that's when someone would say you need to seek guidance mm -hmm. because you, you might not understand it properly and you might end up acting in a way that, I mean, this, not to feed into the news cycle, whatever, sure. but, I mean, a lot of this guy in Chattanooga, 
who shot up the mm -hmm. um, the military recruiting recruitment center. I don't know. I was out of the country. I don't know what ended up happening. Mm -hmm. I remember that he sent a text message that had a hadith in it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the funny thing about that is that the, the hadith that he sent, it's, it's, it's never used in the context of violence. It's used mm. in the context of Sufism and Islamic spirituality, and he just completely misunderstood it. Mm. I, I don't mm. know what, if that was his motivation or, or what, but the point mm. is that let's, take, let's say it was his motivation. Mm -hmm. that, that's precisely why it's dangerous for people to act on their relationship with Scripture. I, I see. Uh, except, you know, mm -hmm. be, you know the, the Quran tells you to be kind to your parents. Okay, yes, yes. we know how to be kind to our parents. That's, we're not going to go and you know, chop our, our mom's head off because we, we <laughs> misunderstand how to be kind. Yes. But, uh, and the sanctity of life. I mean, yeah. this, this is a big piece in it. Exactly. Kind. So, yeah. I mean, there's, but there's all sorts of other ways in which if people have an unmediated relationship with their scripture, mm. they can mm. uh, misunderstand Run into it and, problem. and create danger for themselves and others. A, a, quick, a quick question. Uh, ulama, what is that? What is that? Ulama, ulama yeah. are Muslim scholars. They're Muslim basically scholars. like, I tell people they're basically like Muslim rabbis. I see. I see uh, authorities yeah. in religion. Uh, yes, yeah, so they are they are the people whose job who have taken it upon themselves throughout history to explain Muslim mm -hmm. explain the, the revelation of the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet to Muslims and would to you, God. Would you be considered a ulama? That's a good question. Uh, well, it's in the in the in the classical sense of the in word. The, I mean, that's I mean, I, I guess someone. So I guess I could. Cons I guess I would consider myself one. I wouldn't yeah. consider myself a very good one, but I would I consider myself a, a good professor, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a good scholar. Mm, yeah. yeah. Uh, in the Western sense. Sure. As a, one of the ulama, I would be you know lower lower ranks. You know, I was lower also I, I was struck by your humility of. Uh, of uh, trying to analyze this material from a, from a Western context. And I think you use the Greco-Roman uh, idea uh, quite a few times mm -hmm. in this uh, uh, to, to kind of give a label to, uh, to a particular approach mm -hmm. to uh, this data. And yeah. uh, tell me, just, just a, a little bit, uh, just briefly, what, was, what, was, what inspired that reaction uh, to you? What experience inspired that I think reaction? that was because, uh, first of I mean, first of all, that's the, the majority of my readers would come from that background. I see. Yeah. And second, mm -hmm. because you know, I, what I wanted to say, and one of the things I want to say in the book is that this is, you know, when you talk about the nature of truth, or you talk about uh, how do you, how do people understand texts, mm -hmm. how do they, how do they have ways in which you can allow for a range of disagreement about a text, but also create kind of some kind of order, so you don't have chaos gotcha. in interpretation of texts. Yeah. These are human problems. These are not, these are Greco-Roman problems, these are Chinese problems, these are yeah. Muslim problems. So yeah. actually what you see is that you can give, you can use different labels mm -hmm. and use kind of parallels because they help you understand. They show you that these are actually one, it's a one conversation. Gotcha. Uh, Professor Brown, uh, Pro Professor Brown, you have written two other books, I, I think. Can you just mention books. them? Uh, my first book was called uh, The Canonization of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, mm -hmm. colon, the yeah. formation and function of the Sunni Hadith canon. Uh -huh. That's, I think, that's a big book. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I wrote a, a book called Hadith, Muhammad's Legacy in the Medieval and Modern World. That was sort of a medium-sized book. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote a book for Oxford University Press called, uh, they have a ser series called Very Short Introduction. So I wrote Very Short, short Introduction to the, the Prophet Muhammad. Mm. That's a small book. Yes. Yes. Well, I hope that we increase the sales, Doctor. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Uh, go on, because buy because this is uh, this is. I think your the the book that you wrote here, a misquoting Muhammad, is a necessary book. It is written at the right time, and uh, I think more people should read it. And uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks for inviting and, me. And I was very happy to come it. here. Well, we've been talking to uh, Professor Jonathan A. C. Brown about his new book, misquoting Muhammad. Uh, the challenges of uh, and choices that uh, that we are left with in interpreting the prophet's legacy. Um, if you want to know more about the Scholars Chair, you can go online to Read One Communication channel on YouTube. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. If you want to email us, you can do so at scholarschair at gmail.com. I am Khalil Shadid. Good night.
Hit it. Hit it.